The Blood Drawn Chronicles Season 2, The Ballad of House M, is brought to you thanks to the generous donations of viewers like you. Thank you. If you would like to make a donation towards our next season, titled Season 3, Psalm of the Hellborn Prince, visit www.tbdcpodcast.com for more information. On behalf of everyone here at DigiFox Studios, we want to thank you for listening. And now, our story begins. You really shouldn't spend so much time lost in deep thought, Myrick. Your tea will get cold. Yes, of course. Forgive me. I was just wondering... About the magic of the box, yes. No, actually. That much I have figured out on my own. Oh, is that so? Do tell. It's the melody of the song. The right notes are played to induce hypnosis. The underlining melody is repeated heavily throughout the song. I read that vampires have the ability to hypnotize men. However, a vampire can only hypnotize one person at a time. For someone like Tyrus Godfrey, who was bound to the confines of his castle, I'd imagine the need to hypnotize multiple people at the same time would come in handy. Specifically, if a large mob should ever muster the courage to barge in unannounced. Well, bravo, Mr. Myrick. Indeed, your uncle was right when he said nothing gets past you. But now you have me wondering, what in this moment are you trying to not let pass you? Liana de Leon. I see. Her role does not apply to any logical answer your mind can conceive. Precisely. Your plan was precise. How did Lachance play into it? Curiouser and curiouser, isn't it? Well, the truth is, Lachance was never part of the plan. I saw your coffins hidden beneath the brothel house. No, what you saw was a product with my name on it. My dear Mr. Myrick, you aren't paying attention. I supply countless vampires with inventions stretching from here to the edge of the Asian continent. Trust me when I say, Lachance was not part of my plan, but a most fortunate opportunity nonetheless. Madame de Leon's sister was taken, and I presented her an opportunity to have her revenge. And clearly, you knew my motives for stepping foot in Paris from the moment I arrived. How could I not? You walk the streets in circles every day. It didn't take much to see you were in search of something. Pointing you towards Madame de Leon was simply a matter of time. In Paris, all the lost ones end up at her doorstep one way or the other. And what of the coffins? The coffins belong to an associate of mine, a vampire of whom you have great interest in. Camilla Valentine, the brothel keeper. Brothel keeper? <laughs> Perhaps once, a century ago. But nowadays, she's risen to heights beyond a mere harlot rancher. You must enlighten me, though. How would Camilla serve a purpose finding the Valpia you search after? Tyrus Godfrey suggested she could, just before I broke his neck. A man, or vampire, would say anything to avoid the pain of death. Which brings me to my next question. Why did you let Lord Godfrey live? I didn't. Truth be told, he was the first vampire I encountered. I did not realize vampires took longer to heal than a Valpyr. More so is the fact that Valpyr bones to this date prove to be unbreakable. I never knew bones possessed the ability to heal. My book shows vampire physiology is only human physiology without certain working parts. However, it mentions they possess healing factors common to my species. <clears throat> wait, 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 wait. What book? The one inside my satchel, Diophilus's book. May I take a look? By all means. Remarkable. These drawings are vampires, but what do they say? They speak of the vampire. Their strengths, their weaknesses, their habits. Incredible. I can't read a single thing it says, but clearly this Diophilus has done his homework on us. Actually, the section you're on was written by Dorum. 
Nearly the entire book was written by him, in fact. And Dorum would be... Diopolis's father, Dorum, son of Demeticus, Count of Olburn. You say that as if I should know who that is. Well, perhaps you should. Meaning? Have you ever stopped to ask yourself why you're cursed the way you are? How aside from the natural weaknesses of garlic, silver, and sunlight that plague your kind, there's also the unnatural weaknesses, crosses, the burning inside of churches, holy water, the inability to cross running water, wooden stakes, invitations, the list goes on. You're saying Dorum studied the origins of our curse as well? <laughs> no, Mr. Carley. I'm saying Dorum is the cause of your curses. And you're going to elaborate on that? Very well. Since you have been so graciously open with me, I shall return the favor. My house has been at war with House D since the discovery of this world. Dorum's father, Demiticus, is responsible for the creation of the vampire. It is written in the book you hold that after Demiticus's death, his eldest son, Davrin, sent his younger brother, Dorum, to Earth in hopes of amassing a vampire army the likes of which had never been seen. When Dorum arrived here, however, he was appalled by the savagery of the vampire. Having pity for the defenseless human race, Dorum cursed the undead. I take it Dorum did not share the same taste for bloodshed as his father and older brother. No. He was a kind man, and I dare say the most powerful alchemist I've ever heard of. Dorum Woodbender, they called him, for his uncanny ability to manipulate plant life around him. It was rumored he had the power to make trees walk and raise mountains from the earth with a mere thought. A man like that would have no problem cursing an entire species then, would he? Naturally, with his own blood. He cursed the vampires, saying, If from hell they come, then heaven shall see them there. Thus the reason churches, holy water, crosses are now deadly, I assume? The book also says he blessed woods such as oak, ash, and hawthorn to be fatal should it pierce the heart. Impressive. Whatever happened to him? When he returned from earth, my family had killed his brother. Davrin had no male issue, making Dorum the new head of House D. Shortly after, he brokered a peace treaty between his family and mine by having his daughter Delora marry my uncle Menetheus. Then, shortly after that, he was killed by his son Diophilus. Ah, it's all starting to make sense now. Tell me something, does this book make any reference to artifacts that were used during this event? I'm not quite sure... I understand the question. Does this book speak of using magic relics to help or otherwise hinder the vampire, or the earth for that matter? I'm afraid I'm still at a loss on what you're saying. Oh, gods. It's simple, really. In fact, it's hovering just above you as I speak. Go on, reach for it. I hope you don't mind. I took the liberty of bringing that over to us while you were in the middle of your story. It's... A golden cylinder of some sort. Why, yes, and I think you'll find the gibberish written all over it is the same gibberish written in this book. It's Valpyrian. It would seem that way. I take it you can tell me what it says, then. Barely. This trinket is aged dramatically. Some of the writing has faded away completely. Where did you get this? From a man who's willing to pay a king's ransom to anyone who can decipher it. A man older than the Savior himself, and the only man old enough to own that relic. Alacaster Lovejoy. <laughs> Might I ask what you find so amusing? Do you not find it striking that we should meet like this? Was it not you who planned it so? Actually, I'm beginning to suspect fate had a hand in our encounter now. So far, I only see the fates benefiting you. Well, not necessarily. I've been working on a device for quite some time now that can locate vampires across the world. I mean to use it as a means to broaden my customer base. Are you saying what I think you're saying? When completed, I suppose it can even be used to locate your Diophilus, if such a thing interests you. And in return, you want me to translate what this cylinder says? No, Mr. Myrick, I want you to tell Alacaster what it says. 
I, on the other hand, want to be paid a king's ransom, enough gold to fill a palace treasury. <laughs> Mind sharing what you find so amusing now? For once, I think the gods are smiling in my favor. Gods? Well, we'll have to share opinions on theology one day. I didn't take you for much of a religious man, Mr. Carley. And I'm not. I only worship one god, the god of money, for only he is richer than I. Now come, Mr. Myrick, the night is young. Of course. I'll get to work on deciphering this right away. There'll be plenty of time to work on that when we return. And just where are we going? To a place where the term all work and no play is unheard of. Now then, let us be on our way. <laughs>